Hey everyone, let's talk about investments and specifically uh, performance evaluation and market time. Now this material is going to be out of Bodhi, Kane and Marcus chapter 24 and what we'll cover is how we can measure uh, rates of return on a portfolio over a period of time, uh, how we can then create risk-adjusted measures of performance because obviously that's uh, really what we want to put uh, performance on an even footing, controlling for how much risk it actually takes. Uh, and then we'll talk about market timing um, and attribution analysis. In other words, how we can actually assign uh, performance due uh, to a portfolio managers either being able to pick allocation of uh, of portfolio funds to certain asset classes or sectors uh, relative to how much of that performance comes from being able to select individual securities within those sectors. So we'll begin with uh, just how we actually measure uh, rates of return over a period of time and it's going to require uh, some sort of averaging. Now for investors to be able to measure asset manager performance. Uh, we of course have to create these measures over a span of time and we probably want to take an average to uh, sum up performance over some years. And so the two ways that are uh, really done um, are as follows. There's either time-weighted returns, uh, which simply just sort of looks at how you've done over a span of time, treating each year or any other period. Um, of the portfolio's investment horizon the same as any other, uh, and dollar-weighted returns, which look at how well you've done uh, relative to the proportion of capital that you've been managing at any particular time. And then, of course, once we've created these average measures, then we want to uh, adjust them for risk. So this is something that the CFA curriculum spends some time on, so this is uh, useful to uh, no, both of these alternatives. Um, time weighting essentially is just a geometric average uh, of returns over each individual period compounded up uh, to sort of the overall return across all periods. You can view this as uh, the compounded return over, let's say, n years. So all you do is you just take the return in year one, multiply it, well, compound it uh, by the return in year two, and so on, all the way to year n. And then you take the nth root of it to sort of get the geometric average. Um, in other words, what sort of your equivalent per year return would be, uh, such that you get the same thing as your compounded year by year return. And this, of course, then treats each period's return uh, equally weighted. Uh, you manage a certain amount of money in one year, you earn 5%. Uh, you manage perhaps a greater or lesser amount of money in another and you earn 5% then. That 5% in both years uh, receives the same weighting. And that can be both good and bad. So let's contrast this with a measure that actually does exactly the opposite, uh, weighting your returns by how much capital you're managing, which is dollar weighted. Uh, so this is actually pretty much just the IRR. Um, all we're saying is here is uh, your initial present value. Here are the cash flows that you have uh, generated. What is sort of the rate of return um, implicit in equating uh, the present value to those uh, future discounted cash flows? And what this does is it actually then weights the returns realized each year uh, by the amount of capital invested in that year. Uh, which can be good, right? Uh, in the sense that, well, if you manage to earn 5% uh, managing 100 million, that's probably a greater accomplishment than earning 5% managing 1 million. Um, time weighting would treat those both the same. Dollar weighting does recognize the sort of greater overall contribution of earning the same return on larger capital uh, than on smaller. But the trade-off is that sometimes uh, capital flows aren't necessarily under the manager's control. 
uh, there could be a year in which there's a lot of redemption. Uh, so then dollar weighting would actually penalize the manager uh, for even perhaps great performance simply because uh, there were outflows from the fund. So uh, it's useful to keep both in mind and uh, perhaps compare both at any given time. So let's see how this works in a simple example. Uh, let's say we've got a, a three-year process. So we begin investing in year zero, uh, we invest in year one, and then we finally recognize all proceeds in year two. So what are our uh, time-weighted and dollar-weighted returns over this this period. Well, so here's how our simple investment process is going to work. We're going to, in year zero, buy one share of stock for $50. And then in year one, we're also going to make a second purchase of another share, and let's say the price has gone up a bit, uh, to $53. Now at the same time, we receive some cash inflows. Uh, we receive nothing in year zero, but in year one, we get a $2 dividend. Uh, from that first share we bought in year zero. And then in year two, we get a $4 dividend because by the time the year two dividend rolls around, we are now long two shares, one that we bought in year zero, one that we bought in year one. Um, and let's say that then at the end of year two, uh, we sell both of our shares. By that point, the price is 54. Uh, so we receive twice that or 108. Um, and you can see sort of how keeping track of your cash inflows and outflows uh, is going to be important uh, to calculate uh, these returns per period. So let's look at how we calculate the dollar weighted return. Remember, that's essentially just an IRR, so all we need is uh, the present value um, and the two future cash flows which we can easily enough generate, right? Uh, we're literally just writing a timeline here. Here is our year zero. Here is our year one. Here is our year two. And now we're just saying what our total cash flows are. Well, in year zero, we invested $50. In year one, well, we invested 53, but we made two, so our net investment is uh, 51. So whereas for year zero, we'd write a cash flow of negative 50. Uh, for year one, we'd write a cash flow of negative 51. And then finally, what is our cash flow in year two? Uh, well, we made 108 in capital returns from selling those two shares. And we made $4 in dividends, uh, therefore a total of 112. And then if we write the IRR equation using these cash flows right here, all we're really saying is what is the rate of return per year over these uh, two years after our initial investment in year zero uh, that actually uh, sets the discounted value of the future cash flows equal to our present value, uh, which is that $50 that we paid in initially. And if we calculate IRR in any of our uh, ways that we're comfortable, Excel, financial calculator, uh, we see that the per year rate of return is 7.12, roughly percent, 7.117. That's all well and good. That essentially means that uh, if we sort of take into account how much uh, money we were managing in any given year, uh, we actually then uh, earn about 7.12% per year. How does that stack up with a, a time-weighted average? Well, so if the IRR computation for the dollar-weighted average requires uh, simply looking at uh, cash flows on a timeline, the dollar, uh, the time-weighted average one requires the computation of holding period returns. And you can see that what we have here are just the holding period formulas, where, remember, the holding period return is going to be 
the value of the asset at the beginning of the period. We sell these in bonds, but they're applicable to any asset. So we're going to divide our change in value by the value of the asset at the beginning of the period. And the way that we're going to measure the change is we're going to say the value of the asset at the end of the period plus the value of any cash flows received from that asset at the end of the period minus the value of the asset at the beginning of the period. So if we just plug those three things in, you can see that this 53 is the value of the asset at the end of the period. That's what a share of our stock is worth at the end of year one. 50 is what it was worth at the beginning of year one. Two is the cash flow that we received at the end of year one, because we will assume that the dividend gets paid at the end of the year. Um, you know, if it weren't, we might need to compound it at whatever the interest rate was. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just say the dividend is paid at the end of the year. And then, of course, we divide by, again, the price of the asset at the beginning of the period. And if we calculate that out, we see that the holding period return in the first year, uh, in other words, from year 0 to year 1, is 10%. Now, what's the holding period return from year 1 to year 2? Well, we again use the same formula. It's just that now our uh, beginning of the period is the value in the end of year 1 and the end of the period is the value at the end of year two. So again, we know that the stock at the end of year two was worth 54, so that's its value at the end of the period. Uh, given that we just computed its end of year one value at 53, that is what we're gonna use now for the beginning of the period value for the next period from year one to year two. This share again earns us a uh, $2 dividend, right? And let's say that's again paid at the end of year two. And it is worth 53 at the beginning of that period, uh, as we already know. Uh, by the way, why don't we have to do this like times two or something? Uh, we, earn, we, after all, own two shares now over year one. Uh, but remember, this return is just sort of on a pair share basis. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. All we do is just look at what each share was worth at the beginning of the period, what it was worth at the end, and how much of a dividend it paid out. And then even if we had two shares, well, then each share would return us 5.66, but our total return would still be 5.66%. Now, so what we're going to do is we're going to compound these holding period returns. So we're going to take 1 plus 10% times 1 plus 5.66%. We compounded, compounded two returns, so we now have to take the, uh, the square root to get the uh, average per period return. And that comes to 7.81%. Uh, now, what do we observe? Remember the uh, dollar weighted return was about 7.12%. So we can see that the dollar weighted average is actually less uh, than the time weighted average. Uh, but that makes sense, right? Because remember, we have uh, more money invested in year two. We have two shares, so in other words, two times the capital roughly. Uh, than we have relative to what we had in year one. Uh, so the dollar weighted average actually overweights the lower return that we recognize uh, we got in year two uh, than the higher one we got in year one. And that's why the dollar weighted average gets dragged down. Um, so in practice, which of these gets used more often? Uh, usually the, the time weighted measure. Uh, mostly because that sort of is cleaner relative to uh, these effects on per period returns uh, from uh, capital inflows and outflows that would affect the dollar-weighted returns in the way that we see here. 
um, because again, not all capital outflows are under the manager's control. Uh, obviously, capital might flow out due to bad performance, uh, but it could also uh, just be driven by other uh, macroeconomic trends uh, that don't necessarily mean the manager is underperforming. But at bottom, it's useful to know that these two measures exist and how any differences in them are reconciled. Remember, the time-weighted measure treats all returns the same, regardless of how much capital uh, they were actually uh, returning uh, under per period. And the dollar-weighted return uh, actually weights each return by how much capital was under management during it.